Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Amanda Walter of the San Diego Shakespeare Society. Um, and welcome to our lecture this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We have an excellent speaker in store. Um, but first, of course, a word from our sponsor. So our motto is, we do Shakespeare all year round. Um, so in addition to occasional lectures, such as the one today, we have open readings once a month. Uh, nowadays, we're doing those via Zoom, of course. Uh, we have a neat collaboration with the San Diego Museum of Art called Art Stops. And this is a fusion of artworks and performance. Uh, we have our online Shakespeare showcase, which features talented local actors. Um, so be sure to check out the details on our website if you're not already familiar with these aspects of our society. Um, and of course, we long for the day when we will emerge from lockdown um, and have events in person again, um, particularly our flagship event, the Student Shakespeare Festival, which if you have seen that in the past, uh, you know that it is a fantastic event in Balboa Park. Um, if you want to support us, our annual membership is $35 for an individual, and then for a family, it's $50. Um, so these are minuscule amounts, and uh, so please join us and support the society and the work that we do for um, San Diego and Shakespeare and spreading the good word of the Bard. Uh, so now on to uh, Dr. Garcia. Um, I'm especially thrilled to introduce Dr. L uh, Leticia Garcia today. Um, as she and I attended graduate school together at the University of Birmingham Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, so it's especially warming for me to have the chance to work with her again a decade later. Um, so this is fantastic for us. Um, Dr. Garcia is the UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of English at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and her research focuses on Latin America and Mexican studies, Shakespeare and race, um, culture theory and practice, um, cultural politics and cultural and artistic production. Um, so these are all fascinating, wonderful topics um, that, you know, as we sort of evolve as a society are becoming, you know, more and more um, prevalent in academia. So we're so grateful to have Letty here to discuss some of those things with us. Um, she grew up in Imperial Valley and is a proud Mexicana in higher education. Um, so Letty, thank you so much for being here with us and whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. I'm going to echo Amanda's sentiments. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm so thankful to you, to the Society, for inviting me. I'm just thrilled um, that Amanda extended the invitation. I have such fond and happy, warm memories of sitting alongside Amanda um, in England, which was, for me and I think Amanda, a very special time in our lives. Um, so I'm so happy to be here. Um, and I'm really, really stoked that you have finally moved to the best coast, Amanda. <laughs> um, so before I officially dive in, um, I want to, hold on first, let me share my presentation. Okay. Can everyone see this? You can just give me like a thumbs up, an emoji thumbs up. That's totally cool. Great. Hold on. Let me, okay. So before I officially dive in, I just quickly want to acknowledge and ask permission of the lands and its ancestors to do the work I've been called to do this afternoon. The lands, my university, were built upon in Santa Barbara. Actually, most of the you know, UC campuses here in the state um, were founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those whose lands I work on and live on, the villages and the unceded territories of the Tataviam, the Chumash, and the Tatavam and the Tongva people here in the San Fernando Valley and in Santa Barbara. Oopsie, hold on. As we enjoy the privilege and beauty of these lands and waters support not only our livelihoods, recreation, lifestyles, research, and education. We remember that the Chumash peoples of this area have been separated from these lands, unable to maintain livelihoods as they should, unable to recreate traditionally, unable to maintain their traditional life ways freely, and unable to have the same access to their lands that we are provided, and to do their own traditional research and educate their future generations. So thank you to them for allowing us to be on their land. A little bit about myself. I currently live in Los Angeles, but I grew up in La Frontera on the border in the Imperial Valley, as Amanda mentioned. And my parents and my extended family still reside there. My grandfather came to the US as a bracero from central Mexico. On my mother's side, I have roots in the Quechuan nation in Yuma, Arizona. The border 
is who I am. The border is my home. And to quote the masterful Gloria and Zeldua, I am a border woman. I grew up between two cultures, the Mexican with a heavy Indian influence and the Anglo as a member of a colonized people in our own territory. Having grown up in the borderlands has shaped who I am and the work that I do. And I like to think that I bring all of my favorite things to my research and classroom, my ancestors, my culture, my family, and my friends. My research and teaching is very much so an homage to them and to who I am and the way that I was raised. In the broader scope of my research, I investigate the theatrical, literary, and cultural movements of the Mexican, Latinx, and Chicanx performance traditions. I draw largely from historical, sociocultural, artistic, and performance methods of formal analysis. And this is just a really fancy saying that I'm interested in thinking about the ways in which performance, art, and objects change from culture to culture and how they mean differently when transported and during transport. Considering this, I think a lot about who I am and about my relation to Shakespeare. As a result, I often ask myself these questions every time I prepare to walk into my classroom or to work on a production. What happens if and when you teach Shakespeare and you're a person of color? In my case, as a Mexican American, what happens when you learn about Shakespeare as a person of color? Which Shakespeare is that and to whom does that Shakespeare belong? My friend and mentor, Dr. Ruben Espinoza, a professor at the University of Texas, El Paso, would say that these lines of inquiry are not just about Shakespeare, but about the power structures that define Shakespeare. And this is where I really want to begin and dive in today. I come to the legacy of Shakespeare simultaneously as an insider and an outsider. I am a Latina, but I'm also a Shakespearean. And I begin here simply because I want to acknowledge my place in the current makeup of a discipline and an institution and a performance practice that was not made for me. Personally, and perhaps some of you share the sentiment with me, I'm not the average theater goer. I'm not the average academic. I'm not the average Shakespearean. I am always an audience member of color, a scholar of color, and a Shakespearean of color. The study of Shakespeare was not built for me. And the study of Shakespeare has most certainly reiterated this point. The ways in which I experience Shakespeare are not the norm simply because I'm not the norm. I'm a brown person in an extremely white field. So again, I start here because I really think it's important to acknowledge who I am as an educator, as a practitioner in the current makeup of Shakespeare studies or performance practices, whatever that entails as well as convey the, the intense emotional, the pedagogical and intellectual labor endured by many scholars and practitioners of color as Shakespeare studies, or I should just say Shakespeare the system, grapples with our contemporary realities, both in and out of the classroom, both on and off our stages. Throughout my career as a Shakespearean, I've experienced the dislocation of minorities within the theater, the university, public forums, as well as the discipline of Shakespeare itself. For many years now, the common pedagogical strategies in the place and in the study of Shakespeare suggest to our students that certain cultures are privileged. By this, I mean that particular cultures occupy central positions and individual members of those communities occupy central places in the world of Shakespeare. As Dr. Ambarine Dadevoy from Harvey Mudd College, these divisive strategies mimic, I'm sorry, how contemporary white culture behaves towards diversity. Inclusion and diversity are made the problems of the so-called other and such racialized pedagogies or epistemologies simultaneously conjure and obfuscate their whiteness. This kind of a relationship to pedagogy and literature is what Dr. Marcos Gonzalez identifies as the privilege given to particular writers, the language of a Shakespeare, like the language of a Melville, a Whitman, a Faulkner, a Foucault. It's difficult and it's hard at times. It's elusive and allusive. And sometimes it's inaccessible 
other kinds of writers, let's say the Morrisons or the Torres or the Kincaids, we expect to fully represent and identify, to speak for entire cultures and communities, to be forthcoming and transparent. We expect those who are not like the Shakespeare's or the Whitman's, the Foucault's, to not put up a fight to be understood, to be unchallenging and welcoming, accommodating and unobtrusive. So I know it was a long quote, but I quoted at length here from this powerful essay by Gonzalez titled Caliban Never Belonged to Shakespeare because it cements privilege as that which is afforded complexity, sophistication, while those outside the purview of privilege are judged by their surface superficial affects and their accessibility. The study of Shakespeare has long been a private institution or to be, to be more precise, a white serving institution. Like many of the systems that we navigate in our lives, Shakespeare is not built for many of us. Navigating the terrain of Shakespeare has been filled with gatekeeping, praise, terror, incredulity with little to no sources of affirmation or validation in place for scholars or actors of color, let alone for our students or audiences of color. Seeing yourself not represented anywhere and understanding that many of the white passing Latinxes in academia, in my case, which is the world I operate in, worship at the feet of whiteness, all while waving their country of origins national flag, and it meant that I learned quick lessons about the color of my skin in higher education. The lesson is you can claim authenticity only if it does not threaten white hegemony. It is no surprise then that our stages and classrooms have helped fuel Shakespeare's mystique by unquestioningly incorporating his works into a standard that remains unparalleled in both literary and cultural history. This specter of Shakespeare it's solid, perhaps just as the old colonists intended, but does this model benefit anyone? The first play by Shakespeare that I read was Julius Caesar as a 14 year old in high school in Southern California in the Imperial Valley, a curriculum that for years has borne the legacies of British colonialism. As students in an AP English lit class, we were expected to know and appreciate the literary geniuses of the Shakespeare's, the Wordsworths, and the Keeps of the world, even as we were learning about anti-colonial struggles and movements that shaped so much of 20th century world history just next door in my AP history course. I had no choice in encountering Shakespeare's works. These were and continue to be mandatory texts. The irony is not lost on me, nor am I the first to suggest this idea. Emer O'Toole writes, Shakespeare has been taught in schools and performed under the proscenium arches built where the British conquered. Shakespeare is both a beacon of the greatness of European civilization and a gateway into that greatness. O'Toole here gestures to the fact that translation, travels, both real and imagined, our world and worlds are central to the appeal of the plays themselves. But these experiences and imaginings through the study of Shakespeare also play a vital role in the continued cultural imperialism of the British Empire. Echoing this, Gauri Viswanathan argues that perhaps the most significant effect of post-colonialism with all its shortcomings, blind spots and metropolitan evasions is that the curricular study of English can no longer be studied innocently or inattentively to the deeper contexts of imperialism, transnationalism, and globalization in which the discipline first articulated its mission. It is no small matter that Caliban competes de rigueur with his creator, Shakespeare, as the canonical expression of present day English studies. A crucial part of the civilizing mission as it manifested in British educational policies has always been a devaluing of indigenous works of literatures and traditions while cementing and valorizing and uplifting the English canon. So given this history, you might ask why Shakespeare then Letty? Why are you continuing to sort of labor in your pedagogy service and research to improve the diversity, tolerance and inclusivity of Shakespeare? 
and overall in general to help my students navigate the afterlives of these works in our contemporary moment? The answer is simple, because we have to, because I have to, as Amanda mentioned in the beginning, it's a really prescient time to be thinking about these new modes of inquiry. So because as a visible and visibly brown person, I have to continuously fight for recognition and a revaluation of indigenous voices. And because Dr. Mary Rambaran Ohm teaches us that the classroom is our battlefield. And to that, I would add our stages as well. To this, I would add Madeline say it's called to interrogate the Shakespeare, system. not Shakespeare the playwright or Shakespeare the poet, but Shakespeare the system in the way that he operates on a global universal capacity. I refuse to ignore the oppressive and violent tactics deployed in the Shakespeare system, like Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, I refuse the call to order, and I refuse to call others to order and to refuse that interpolation. And I refuse that call by revaluing the indigenous voice, the indigenous literature, that indigenous culture, and reordering the existing symbolic order of the Shakespeare system. Accruing firsthand experience of the uneven landscape of academia has sharpened my understanding of the challenges facing students in our classrooms with Shakespeare and has led me to pose the following questions. What is the responsibility of the scholar and discipline as a whole to the broader community in which they are located? What is our responsibility as educators in a leading field of study? And the same goes for our stages. How can we conceive of a theater that is inclusive? What is our responsibility to our audiences, to our actors? Through my work, I found the means to address these same inequities both in and out of the classroom. Like many who are, like many of us who are working to diversify our stages, our programming and our educational practices, we come to our study or our objects of study, I should say, vis-a-vis -vis our individual journals and histories. And in saying this, in many ways for me, Shakespeare has always been and can only be Mexican, Chicanx, Latinx. And I insist that our contemporary context provide crucial material for a more critical relationship to his work. And key to this is an understanding that while global or universal may suggest as Jay Pather does, quote, a blithe acceptance of Shakespeare simply and reductively as universal, end quote. For me, the Shakespeare we encounter in our contemporary classrooms and stages suggests something more critical, discursive, something more layered, ambiguous, and ultimately rich and fiercely contemporary. All of this has become evident to me as an educator and practitioner. In my classroom, I began to experience the ultimate predicament of teaching race and we're tackling diversity in the field of Shakespeare. Citing Dad Boy again, I realized that it is virtually impossible to teach texts from this canon without drawing our students' attention to the mechanisms of difference that permeate much of this work. To this, I would add, the responsibility we bear in diversifying our field and questioning the value and investments in canons. For these reasons, I urge us to look to Shakespeare and his diverse capacities in the classroom and on our stages as each year we grow more diverse. It has only roughly been about 528 years that finally we have begun to incorporate the inclusion of curriculum and programming that promotes and develops diversity initiatives within our pedagogical and performance practices. In fact, in 2019, Edinburgh University Press published Teaching Social Justice Through Shakespeare, a collection that is open access, by the way, if you look it up, you can download the full PDF of the book. Um, this book and this collection itself looks to the intellectual impact of teaching Shakespeare by using the classroom as a creative space for social formation and action. Of primary interest to me is not the range of ways we can radicalize and diversify how we approach the Shakespearean legacy and canon. I'm less interested in fortifying that one, that canon. Rather, 
And as a book like Teaching Social Justice through Shakespeare prompts us to question, I ask, and to what extent Shakespeare studies and performance should encompass a broader spectrum of, dare I say, color, of experience, of culture? So again, I return to my opening quandary. What happens if and when you teach Shakespeare as a person of color? And what happens when you think about Shakespeare as a person of color? Which Shakespeare is that and to whom does that Shakespeare belong? How do I, an educator constrained by the colonial criteria of higher ed, create a space where a student can freely learn and embody these concepts in the classroom and specifically in dealing with Shakespeare. How do I approach these texts as part of what I do as an educator in the United States? And all of this is to say that the work that I do in the classroom is almost by definition political, right? I insist that my students learn to talk in informed ways about race and nationality, sexuality, and class, right? These are all constitutive factors in a script that are just as important as let's say plot, character, theme, and so on. The two go hand in hand for me. To mark the distinction between the agenda of the canon and my pedagogy, we have to negotiate an alternative path of historical and critical reading in the study and performance of Shakespeare. So rather than taking the American or European canon as a point of departure. My approach entails assessing Shakespeare's cultural production while allowing for a plurality of voices to emerge. In Teaching to Transgress, Bell Hooks reminds us that despite the contemporary focus on multiculturalism in our society and specifically education, there is not nearly enough practical discussion of ways classroom settings can be transformed so that learning experience is inclusive. As a Shakespearean in more senses than one, I understand the sentiment all too well. I am a scholar, a teacher, a practitioner, and a community activist. In the classroom, I reinforce this positionality and alert my students to our localization in relation to Shakespeare. I want to see and hear a Shakespeare that is like me, Latinx, Chicanx, Mexican, Spanish, Spanglish, Pocho, Pachuco, whatever it is, but this is hardly ever the case. Locating my students and I in the broader socio-political and cultural politics of Shakespeare's diffusion and cultural agency in Latinx and Mexican history. And what a Shakespeare of this devising might look like, I look to a borderlands Shakespeare, a mode of performance that derives from the peripheral space of the US-Mexico borderlands. As Gloria and Zaldúa suggests, the experience of being on the periphery, or in this case, La Frontera, compels us to shift out of the habitual formations. And these formations that ultimately allow us for a more whole perspective, one that includes rather than excludes. Such a performative and pedagogical strategy compels us to shift, right, to open doors to important classroom conversations about race, immigration, assimilation, linguistic diversity, ethics, and the concurrent promise and limits of belonging for Chicanexes in a post-Obama society, as Professor Ruben Espinoza notes in his essay, Chicano Shakespeare. California, hold on, I'm just letting someone in. California border communities, in particular, the Imperial County where I grew up, is neighbor to the south by the state of Baja, California, much like you are in San Diego. To the east is Arizona and to the west, San Diego. They are inescapable to the convergence of barriers, their permeability and cultural influences of the migrant groups. These immigrant cities put to question ideologies of cultural identity, global political life, tradition and culture contributing to the evolution and transformation of nearly every aspect of social life, not only on the borderlands, but also within the US. And this includes the representation and evolution of the arts. In typical Southern California communities, primarily populated by people of Mexican descent and self-identified as Mexican Americans, Shakespeare doesn't factor frequently in the everyday lives of border dwellers. At least I can safely say this for the Imperial Valley where I grew up. 
The members of the communities touched by Shakespeare's works are the ones that have been exposed to Shakespeare through public and private education sectors. Performances are rare and even rarer is the cultural and literary presence of Shakespeare. Anzaldúa writes, quote, borders are set up to define the place that the places that are safe and unsafe to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. This indeterminacy is real. The borderlands have never been stable. As an inhabitant, an inhabitant of the border, I've worked with and against this duality my entire life. This was reflected at home and school and in my social world. I still inhabit this bifurcated state. Growing up, I had very little exposure to Shakespeare, let alone a Shakespeare that reminded me of home, of my culture, of my traditions. That is why, while living in England and studying Shakespeare with Amanda, I was really surprised and elated to come across a very special production. The tagline of this Midsummer Night's Dream oddly read, come take a magical Shakespearean romp through Hopeville. Love gets confused, mirages make mischief and bickering vegetables rehearse the play. Can everything possibly get sorted out in time for the carrot festival? Absolutely nothing in this tagline is reminiscent of the play's traditional performance history. In fact, the production, which I'll share more about with you in a minute, was performed in front of an audience reflective of an important demographic trend, what critics have referred to in the past as, quote, the Latinization of Southern California. A Hopeville Night's Dream was staged by Cornerstone Theater of Los Angeles in the summer of 2007 in the county where I was raised. Located in Imperial County, the city of Hopeville, with a population of about 7,000 citizens, serves as the background to Shakespeare's Athenian comedy. Here, agriculture, the heat, and food are the cornerstone of the typical Imperial County upbringing. And if any of you have traveled to the valley, I can assure you that it gets really, really hot there. The Cornerstone Theater summer residency for this particular production was located in the hybridized space, ooh, sorry, in the hybridized space of the US-Mexico border, a collaboration with local residents, the cast of 62 included 52 community members, and for the first time in the community that I grew up in, hold on, bear with me just a minute. I left the other part of my paper in the printer. So for the first time, in the community that I grew up in, Shakespeare was made familiar and approachable, and most of all, culturally relevant. The significance of place and culture dominated the production as it was the first time Shakespeare had been staged in a culturally applicable production in the area. The levity and carefree nature of the geographic area is palpable in the play's adaptation as well as the bisection of the international boundary dividing us from our neighbors to the south. The production itself was unique as it utilized many customs native to the area. Cultural productions of this nature are rare. Well, at least in 2007, it was rare. It's not so much the case now. Adapted by Alison Carey and directed by Laurie Woolery and the, and the citizens of Hopeville, the play substitutes the actual town's reputation as the carrot capital of the world for Athens. Theseus and Hippolyta's wedding party have become committee members and participants of the annual carrot festival. Hermia, Lysander, Demetrius, um, and Helena are portrayed as students at the local high school. The world of Oberon and his fairies are transformed into desert mirages. And a group of gossiping Hispanic women and men meta theatrically discuss the play as it unfolds in Spanglish. And then some for some odd reason, a ship of Vikings rescue fair Hermia in the woods and new characters are introduced to the play text. The rude mechanicals have become crops, including Bottom as a carrot, who was later turned into the local irrigation district's water safety mascot by Puck. Much like the recent trends in the last 15 years or so toward a global Shakespeare, 
Cornerstone Theater's 2007 production shed new light on the importance of multicultural integration and importance to understand ethnicity and culture through Shakespeare's works. Such performances and festivals geared toward an inclusive, diverse Shakespeare are utilizing Shakespeare's versatility to identify with geography, space, cultures, theater, and performance practices and languages and audiences from across the world. And here I really want to stress that there are so many performances, and I'm sure you've all seen some of them, that claim to be really culturally competent, but in fact in most cases they go terribly awry or at least I sit there and I'm thinking like this is terrible this is horrible how could they get away with this but Cornerstone is special and this production itself is of particular importance as the social political historical and cultural shifts of the geographic region are heavily reflected in the company's interpretation as previously mentioned Imperial County as a border space has limited performance instances in the world of Shakespeare by engaging in the cultural production, the collaborative effort between Cornerstone and the city of Hopeville altered Shakespeare's play as we are familiar with it quite significantly. Place, art, and culture within the border are typically ascribed to the hard borders of globalization and hybridization. Yet within the production, and this production specifically, a diversification occurs. The spheres of Shakespeare of Mexico, of Southern California, all merge to allow for a greater artistic experimentation, leading to a remapping of what it really means to be culturally hybridized in the present day. To borrow from Chicana scholar and artist Amalia Mesa Vines, quote, I think it's hard for people to understand that all the time that sorry, that all the time California has been California, it's always been Mexico. It's invisible to everyone except Mexicans. We've known it, we see it and we live it, but most Californians don't know it or don't want to acknowledge it. The fluidity of Mexican culture destabilizes perceptions of borders and lends itself well to the universal appeal of Shakespeare. A production of this nature creates reciprocal engagements among our public audiences students and humanity scholars, theater practitioners and teachers to explore intersections of Shakespeare and Latinx drama with particular emphasis on the cultural production of the US-Mexico borderlands. This is an example of a play functioning as an exceptional vehicle of localization of Shakespeare's original in a new context in which the space of the borderlands is allowed to flourish from these foundational moves. At their core, these politically inflected localizations constitute the radicalism of reimagining Shakespeare in a borderlands context that helps audiences and students think of Shakespeare outside the confines of the English world. In Cornerstone Theater's production, the ambiguities of the Shakespearean text are exploited with careful consideration to show how the act of retelling initiates its own set of references, altering our familiarity with the known object or event, in this case with Midsummer, and with it expressing new political viewpoints. A short example may clarify my argument. Instead of the marriage of Pyramus and Thisbe that we traditionally get at the end of the play, Cornerstone's production replaces a play within a play with some of Imperial Valley's actual history, an adaptation of Harold Bell's The Winning of Barbara Worth, a novel inspired by early settlers of the region in which during the construction of an irrigation system in a Southwestern town, an engineer and a local cowboy vie for the affections of a rancher's daughter. And you might be familiar with the 1925 silent film version of Wright's novel starring Gary Cooper. This move, metaphorically strengthens the production's ethos of collaboration and cultural integration through their performance. Founded in 1986, Cornerstone Theater, their touchstone and their artistic mission was to adapt classic works to tell stories of both rural and urban communities. The multi-ethnic ensemble-based theater company 
specializes in this type of community-based collaboration. And it travels all over Southern California, as well as the American Southwest to form these relations with communities, to educate about theater and to use the power of theater to, to really allow people's hometowns and cultures to flourish. Thus, the localization of this Borderlands Midsummer is vital as the theater company allows for an interpretation circumscri circumscribed by the interweaving of US-Mexico relations, culture, history, and treating a reading as much from its spaces of discursive difference as much as from its Shakespearean center. In closing, I want to return to Ruben Espinosa's groundbreaking, groundbreaking work as a Chicanx scholar of Shakespeare who writes from the US-Mexico borderlands in Chicano Shakespeare, the bard, the border, and the peripheries of performance, Espinoza beautifully proposes that what Shakespeare affords Chicanx students who are forced to negotiate perceptions of their linguistic and cultural inferiority in the US speaks meaningfully to social justice initiatives striving to advance dignity, legitimacy, and social equity for Chicanxes, and more broadly, Latinxes, who often struggle to locate their place in American society. Foregrounding and legitimizing the influence of Chicanx culture on the making of Shakespeare in our day. When students can confidently engage Shakespeare, they lay claim to a legacy that belongs as much to them as it does to anyone else. And this becomes a springboard for apprehending their legitimacy both within and beyond the borders of academe. As a scholar of color, who is most concerned with bringing to the surface the narratives buried at the bottom of historical troves, I hope that by unearthing a more nuanced cultural landscape in our expanding disciplines, and by paying close attention to issues of representation, inclusivity, and diversity, we can transform our pedagogical practices in the classroom and in the theater. I want to usher in a climate of change and perspectives when thinking through Shakespeare and performance. I really want us to think about new kinds of Shakespeare. I want to see new kinds of Shakespeare. And by this, I mean that I think it's time to think about a Latinx Shakespeare or a borderland Shakespeare as a way of entry into Shakespeare. So how do I, a border woman that grew up between two cultures engage Shakespeare? The answer to this question is rooted in my ability to locate my place in American culture and society. This talk today then speaks of my existence, and I hope it encourage you, encourages you to think about your own existence as it relates to Shakespeare. In thinking through this, I hope that we continue to strive toward more legible and audible performances, instruction, and scholarship of marginalized cultures within the world of Shakespeare. What this means is that there are certain approaches to performance that allow us to see ourselves in a nuanced way. They, in turn, allow us to inhabit actual practices of production that speak to a new reality and a new kind of Shakespeare. Thank you. That's all I have for you today. I will stop sharing. Sorry, I had to get up. I can't believe like my last few pages were in the printer. It's okay. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> We've all been there. Well, I think at this time, what we would like to do um, is give participants an opportunity to ask some questions um, to Dr. Garcia. Um, so if there's anything that uh, you would like to further explore in the topic or some questions that you would like to ask her as a, a scholar and a, an educator, um, we'd like to open that up now. Um, so you should be able to, and Nathan, if you can allow this to happen, um, unmute yourself and ask a question um, to Dr. Garcia. I just wanna make sure we can facilitate that before I they ask your question. Hi, I have a question. My name is Deborah Shaw. I'm a teacher at uh, La Jolla Country Day School uh, right near the UTC Mall. Really? And I thought, I thought the talk was wonderful. And the whole time you were talking, I was thinking about, ooh, how can I do this with the Shakespeare plays that I'm teaching? And, and so I, it was just, just tremendous. I really appreciate the talk. Um, I have a question for you about the word La Frontera, the way you yes. used it. Because it means, technically it means border, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I had a lot, a lot of years of French, so, so just, just bear with me. Um, but you talked about it, 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 the connotation for me when you were talking about it, you also used it to mean periphery. Yes. And I, I was wondering how much of that is 
connotation and interpretation and how much of that is actually what the word means and whether or not everybody who knows the language sees both. This is a, an awesome question. Thank you, Deborah. So, you know, I grew up in the Imperial Valley. It's a, it's a border space. It's a border city. Spanish is my first language. So my first understanding of the border was La Frontera. Always that. And I still refer to it in that way. I very rarely say like the border, right? In my academic work, I do. But La Frontera is La Frontera. So for me, it's very much so a connotation of experience and interpretation, right? Because it is the periphery. And I think something that's unique about the border space that I grew up in that is very different from like the San Diego-Tijuana border is that the border between Mexicali and um, and Calexico, which is that border, is very fluid. It's much more fluid and integrated and porous than I would say the San Diego-Tijuana border, right? So for me, it's kind of a, a mishmash of everything, but it's definitely of experience, interpretation, and connotation, but it is also periphery, right? And I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that, I don't know, I guess thinking about border, border sounds so finite, right? It's so, it's so harsh and abrasive, but periphery is different, right? It's, it's demarcating something, but do we accept whether or not that's, you know, a warranted kind of line of demarcation, right? I'm not sure if that answers your question, but for me, that's sort of how I approach it and think about that border. That was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Well, Hi, Donna. you mentioned something. Hi. I enjoyed that. And um, I was raised in San Diego. And uh, I'm also aware of two cultures from a kind of a different perspective. Yeah. Um, and um, I was wondering why you personally referred to your culture as having been considered inferior. Uh, I, I, I have not seen that. Um, in my small community I grew up in, uh, which was years ago even, um, the Mexican people were considered possibly from a slightly different culture, but yeah. uh, uh, no, nothing was said about them. I, I hadn't, I've never heard of anything said that, that they were inferior. Yeah, um, so the way that I mean inferior is thinking about sort of my positionality within the university system. It's definitely coming from a place of higher ed. Um, you know, I've had people tell me that there is no value in the work that I do, right? Because nobody really cares about what a Mexican Shakespeare or a Latinx Shakespeare can do for Shakespeare, right? Um, so it's very much so within the confines of the ivory tower that I mean that, right? And it's something that is... You know, I'm not the only person who feels like that. I think a lot of non-white people who operate in higher education feel this way, right? Or you feel in a way that you kind of have to skirt around just how ethnic you are, right? In a way that isn't always welcome, right? Or if you kind of bring it to the table, you're rebuffed or it's not always as welcome. That's what I meant by that. I agree with that. I see that. Uh, yeah. I understand that systemic uh, type, which is... Yeah a parent I've also been in grad school and I'm I have to be a writer I'm a playwright but uh <clears throat> well what what I just found valuable in your discussion was looking at my own place in my own city and there's been other uh considerations uh I've had feelings of not being considered equal at the table uh coming from an uneducated yeah. uh lower middle class background and I, I think you're right as far as when you get into the uh, higher echelons of education, that that type of thing would be more apparent as other types of systemic racism are. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's always, um, you know, I call it, it's like the imposter syndrome, right? And people are always ready to let you know that your seat at the table is you know, not guaranteed, right? So absolutely. Um, and it's more so from that, right? And I've always, um, growing up, I think also one thing that's really unique about the Imperial Valley is, um, to me, I grew up 
and there's black people there, there's Asian people there, there's Muslim people there. And I'm like, everyone's Mexican in a way. It's such a unique space and where everyone just kind of appreciates sort of Mexican and Hispanic culture, right? Um, and I was so fortunate to grow up that way. And I very much so value who I am and the culture and the way that I was brought up. And I bring that sort of with me into, into the university, which is very often not the norm. Right. And, you know, so it's sad, but so often I'm some of my students, very, very first Latinx teacher, right, ever in the history of their entire lives. And it's 2021. Right. But it's just kind of thinking about that, which which can be difficult. But thank you so much for bringing that up, Donna. Sure. Uh huh. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And Steve, I just wanted, Steve wrote me, um, he sent me a message. Yes, um, Borderlands is a fantastic book. I'm actually rereading it right now. I decided it it would be my first read of 2021 just because Anzal Dua, she's, she's a boss. She's awesome. I have a question. Go ahead, Gordon. Uh, I, I love the uh, quotation you gave about the, the, the production has been staged where the British conquered. Mm -hmm. And that was a matter of a gateway to greatness. It just reminds me of how in India today, uh, very Shakespeare is very big, and there are many, you know, uh, Bollywood productions of adaptations of his movies. One of his uh, or, uh, one of his productions is a uh, one of the best Macbeths uh, in in movie form. And uh, but it also reminds me a few years ago, the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, put on a production of Julius Caesar mm -hmm. set in post-independence Africa. <laughs> and Caesar was a, a, a strong man, a leader like Mugabe probably. And it was so neat, the soothsayer was like a native shaman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I enjoyed it, but then I'm, I'm a Swede. And so maybe <laughs> it really doesn't. And I just think too, later what you said about these productions needing to be culturally competent. And I, I, I assume you would agree, you know, you can't just take uh, uh, a producer or a theme and put it in a different culture mm -hmm. and put different costumes on. But but is that going to what, like with the Holtville experience, you really need to adapt it a little more. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a great point. Um, Amanda and I actually watched that production because it went on when we were there. Um, and it was, that production is interesting, but so often the cases that we tread into the realm of cultural appropriation, right? It's really easy to be like, hey, I want to do a Western, let's do a Western like midsummer, right? Let's just bring in some hay bales and put on some hats and call it a day, right? But what does that really mean, right? To do a Western and I'm actually, I have a piece coming out um, probably later this year on a really horrendous production that the Globe did in 2017, which was an adaptation of Much Ado About Nothing set during the Mexican revolution. But they just totally missed the mark on everything. Like they, the music was like Spanish flamenco. Like it was just ridiculous on all levels. And my whole point is like, why do these institutions like the Globe or the RSC kind of get things wrong? Like they have the resources to do things appropriately, but do they not care? Or, or it's 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 just kind of like a fanciful idea. Like, oh yeah, it's, it's trendy to do a Mexican much ado, right? But what does that mean? Right. And one thing that I really appreciate about Cornerstone, and I'm not sure if you're all familiar with, with them, and they're a pretty old institution. They're based here in LA, is they call it their summer residency. So by the time that they show up to do the play in Hopeville, they've already spent the previous year researching the area geographically, politically, socially, right? They've been there living in the community for about a year. And once they're kind of ready to get things going, um, they start to meet with sort of townspeople to be like, we have this idea for the play, let's write it together, right? So they even write the script with community members. So it's not like they just come in, take over and like, this is what we're doing. And it's very intensive work, but it's really interesting. They also have like, um, what they're most famous for is their Watts cycle. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with it. They did five plays that dealt with sort of the Latino and black neighborhoods in Watts here in LA right? Um, they do them by cycles. And that kind of work, especially with Shakespeare, right, I think is so, so important and so apropos, right? Because Shakespeare, Shakespeare's not going anywhere. He's going to be that vehicle that we turn to constantly. So I think that in an instance like this, Cornerstone Production, it's like, yes, let's do more of this. Let's do less of a Mexican much ado at the Globe, just because it sounds 
trendy or hip or woke. So it's absolutely that kind of combo, Gordon, that I think is so important. Other questions? Well, I mean, hey, Letty, I, I wanted to jump in. Um, you know, what I thought was really fun when you uh, brought up Cornerstone, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with them, but what some people may not know uh, that, that you probably do know is that their founding artistic director is Bill Rausch, who uh, many people may associate that name with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. He was named yes. the artistic director. He went from Cornerstone to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, worked there for a number of years. Uh, and then in 2016 was named uh, the new artistic director of, uh, of a new theater that they're, they're still in development. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's fun for people to kind of create and see different and more Shakespeare connections that somebody like Bill doing this non-traditional work uh, is still recognized and, and celebrated and then goes on to, you know, do stuff uh, at Oregon. Yeah. It's, and it's cool. And, you know, and Bill, and I think it's Paula, not Paula Donnelly, it's Bill, and another woman and another man, which I can't remember their names now because now I'm nervous. Um, they all were trained at Yale, right? So they're Yale theater grads and they kind of started this project like driving around the country in a van, right? They were like, let's just drive around the country and learn about people and make theater that way, which I think is something that is so important and kind of so badass that they do that, right? Because especially for me growing up in the Imperial Valley, theater and kind of high art, right, was largely inaccessible, especially to a lot of rural communities, right? Um, and, you know, Mexicali is not, it's a really big city, it's a metropolitan city, but not in the same way that Tijuana is, right? So even Tijuana has theater and does all of these kind of amazing artistic things. Um, but there's not a lot of that where I grew up, right? And sometimes people ask me, like, how, do, how are you even like a Shakespeare professor? And I'm like, I have no idea. Like I have no idea like what like what led me to here. Um, but it was a lot, for me, it was a lot of the mentorship of my teachers, like my high school English teachers. And then I went to community college, then I went to San Diego State, um, and then I transferred to the Institute. But it's it's really interesting to to see the way in which people use theater as not just kind of for entertainment, but it's education and community activism, which is something I really mm -hmm. appreciate mm -hmm. about Cornerstone. Yeah. You know, I also really appreciate that um, you're willing to take uh, theaters to task and in terms of their uh, setting of, of the plays. Uh, and, and of course, the Old Globe is not the only offender uh, in this case. The, you know, there's there's a lot of theaters where uh, you'll go to the show and go, oh, they just happen to have these sets that they wanted to do something else with or they had to do these costumes. And, you know, I remember actually in college studying uh, kind of from a dramaturgical standpoint, uh, what it really takes to take a play mm -hmm. and 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 apply uh, you know apply it to a different setting a different time and and there's a lot of thought and care that I think if you're going to be successful it goes into it looking at well what are the you know uh, of the place that I want to put it into what are the themes of, of you know what are the dynamics what's the story that is going on there and does this play match with it does it you know does it uh, obliterate those other things you know and, and how do we make it a really authentic uh, production and, and I think you know maybe people would be surprised to know how much work can go into that but but I think that's that's how you make something really successful and it also feels that you're not just uh, I don't know if whitewashing is the correct term here but that that you're tr I, I kind of look at it to the same degree of like when you go to a foreign country you at least make an attempt to say things <laughs> yeah. like thank you or hello or goodbye or you, you know you you're not just assuming well, I know English, so I'm just going to assume you know, you know what I'm saying yeah. without me attempting to learn your language. That that there's at least, and certainly for those people who are of that culture that might come to see that production, uh, that they feel like their history and their story has been really honored in terms of the people who've really thought about it from the costumes to the music to you know all the directorial choices. So I, I appreciate you bringing yeah. that up. Yeah, of course, and and I think that's such an important aspect of it because for me. I almost think it's even more dangerous when people were like, oh, well, we just were doing it as an homage to that culture. And I'm just like, okay, well then you should have done a lot better because it's kind of embarrassing, right? That Shakespeare's Globe in London is putting on this production. And, and it was so weird and in a way so unfortunate, right? Because then what, what happens after that? How many people go to Shakespeare's Globe in London to see a play? Right. Thousands in a given year, right? 
And for someone who's never been to Mexico, who goes to see a production that looks like this, they're like, this is Mexican. This is what the the globe is telling me that this is what it is. And it only perpetuates a specific kind of stereotype, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one has to be really careful, but like you're saying, it's, it's a lot of work to, to do it and it can be done well, right? It it has been, and can be done well. Yeah. And and, and I think it's the the same kind of point of like, if you don't want to do all the work, that's fine. Just do the play Shakespeare Road. You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to change the setting or or anything. You can just, if you don't want to do the work to be, you know, sensitive to the culture that you want to put the story into, that's fine. Just, you know, set it in, you know, uh, 16th century uh, Verona or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I think, you know, not to like, segue but I think this is what really matters like for my teachers out here in the audience today it really does make a difference for the students to see and hear something that is familiar to them you know um there's this fabulous project that was ongoing last year it's called the qualities of mercy project where a lot of universities around the country had their students record that quality of mercy speech from Merchant of Venice and you got such an amazing kind of student-led movement of what is a Shakespeare and what does it sound like, right? Mm. And it's not the 16th century Verona one, right? But thinking about the ways in which it matters for our students to be able to participate in a way that's accessible, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I always say this to my students, it's like, I wanna see another period Romeo and Juliet, right? Like, give me something new because it's like, I wanna, uh, I don't know, it's like every time I see Othello, and I'm just like, do something interesting with it, right? Um, it's just kind of, to me, it's boring, right? It's boring and we can do something much more inventive, right? That then is meaningful in the classroom. Well, well I wanted and, to and, say, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. About that, if you don't mind, um, <clears throat> I'm Donna again. Um, I think that you're absolutely right. Um, I think our little festival here in Balboa Park that includes students, they sort of instinctively do something different with Shakespeare. Yeah. And I think that, don't you think that unless we uh, consider environments uh, uh, where these plays are taking place and, uh, you know, especially for younger people, that if we don't do that, uh, there's a, a point where Shakespeare won't be as relevant. And also it, you just perpetuate uh, sort of the, exclusivity of the study of Shakespeare unless unless you do these things that are new and different and possibly experimental. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like there's there's a huge movement of that happening now, right? Thinking about, um, I'm not sure if you all caught this earlier last summer, but you can listen to it online, but you know, the public theater they couldn't do their play, right? So they ended up doing a radio play version um, that you can now hear as a podcast of Richard II with an entirely black and brown cast, right? And they built into it lectures thinking about, you know, the black carceral like body and thinking about what was going on, you know, with Black Lives Matters and all of these things. And it was such a unique way to sort of experiment with Shakespeare and what we traditionally expect, right? Um, and you can access that play through the public theater and WNYC um, and take a listen because it's so it's so necessary, right? To think about the ways we can experiment with Shakespeare and do things that are that are new and that are different, right? We live in such a different world than Shakespeare did. And What's it called again? I'd like to access that. Um, it was a uh, it was Richard II, uh-huh. um, and it was put on by the New York Public Theater. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, and it's available as a podcast now. Oh, great. Yeah. But um, I forgot what I was saying, but yeah, it's it's great to think about the ways in which we can be, how can we do differently with Shakespeare, right? It's sort of what I'm all about. Well, and if I could add to that, speaking of the Student Shakespeare Festival, I put in a, a plug yeah. uh, when it comes back. I, a couple of years ago, I remember this one group, you know, typically they put on set performances, but this one group of kids, they took as a premise Twelfth Night, and they took characters from Twelfth Night, but they put them in a Jerry Springer TV (laughs) show panel, and they had them yelling at each other, and and their mustaches would fall off and things like that, and lose a disguise, 
but it was incredible how how they uh, dissected that and deconstructed Shakespeare that way and put that put it back together in that format. It was just an amazing experiment they went through. But yeah, that's how, and that's really people engaging the subject. I think. Yeah, and I like to think, you know, I always say this to my students, and even when I'm working on a production, I'm just thinking you know, I think Shakespeare would have wanted us to deconstruct his work, right? That's kind of one of the the funny things about him is like, he didn't really care what you did with his work. He was just like, I don't even care if my plays get published, right? But I think he would encourage us to think outside the box. And it's to me, and you know, Amanda can probably like add to this as well Is that's one of the kind of amazing things about Shakespeare. Look at his canon, it's, global right his plays are set all over the world with different kinds of people it's not like all of his plays took place in london right actually none of his plays took place in london except for the histories but um thinking about that kind of global capacity and that global reach um and something funny is you know merchant of venice is the is the only play in the canon to mention mexico Right. So it's like Shakespeare knew that Mexico was a thing, right? When his ships are sailing at the beginning, they're like, my ships are out to Barbary, blah, 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 in Mexico. And I'm just like, wow, that's amazing. Right. There is a kind of a global imaginary here already that's it's ripe for sort of sort of for the taking. I think I, I want to comment too is um, you know, as a is a a white educator uh, of high school students, um, you know, dealing with race, sexuality, dealing with all of these things, especially um, teaching in Florida, where I, I had been for most of my career. Um, you know, it's it's hard. It is hard work to access Shakespeare's um, canon for for the students, for teachers. Um, and I think one of the realizations that I had early on is that you know we as as educators find it very easy to get into the groove of things. And in fact, once you hit your third year and you have your curriculum and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, this is how I do things. And so infrequently we are given time by administration or by, by the school board to actually grow and to learn these, these different ways of teaching. Um, and so when I was kind of looking at uh, specifically Othello and teaching it, has, uh, you know, much more race focused mm -hmm. um, text, obviously, uh, it, it was a, it was a difficult time. It took me all summer to kind of unpack the text. Um, but I think that as an educator, I'm asking my students to do difficult work mm -hmm. daily. And so I as a teacher should also be doing those things. Um, what would you what do you think is important for students? I mean, you were talking about being um, the first, you know, Latinx teacher that your students had had, which is in incredible. You're absolutely right. Um, do you think that these types of teachings need to come from a, a person of color, that they're more important when they do? Or do you think that as a white educator, um, like I have a place here and I should be accessing that? Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question and such a a timely, you know, I think it's on all of our minds. And I've just been in a diversity, equity, and highfalutin training this whole week. And, you know, it's anxiety inducing for, for white educators. I understand that anxiety and that kind of trepidation, but absolutely you should be, you know, doing these plays in that way, right? It doesn't matter that you're white and I'm brown, right? Um, the fact of the matter is, is that so long as we sort of take the time to pay attention to to that play as a race play right um and and think about you know what is enough what does a fellow mean in 2021 what does a fellow mean because of the trump administration right what does it mean because of black lives matter you can't you can't negate that right that would be the disservice to your student right to be like we're just going to think of a fellow in this way and you know when I was teaching my freshman last year, we read Midsummer, and one of my students was like, this is a racist play. He was like, why does he saying like, get off of me, you Ethiop? He's like, that is not okay. And that already signals there that there's something, you know, dirty or bad about being an Ethiop, right? And so we unpack that, right? And you can't kind of just gloss over it. So absolutely you do. And it's difficult, right? It's difficult for me as well to do to do that kind of work. Um, I often work against another layer where I had a student once who would always question me like, but how do you know that? He would be like, how do you know that? Like, how do you know that the things you're saying are valid? And I'm just like, did I not go to graduate school for a thousand years, <laughs> right? 
to think to be able to sort of get up here and speak confidently right but it's challenging but it's it's the necessary work and it's one thing that i think is so unique about shakespeare right because we turn to shakespeare for these lessons i'm not necessarily turning to edith wharton for these lessons right in my classroom so thinking about the ways in which Shakespeare is such a, a vibrant and kind of unique tool for unpacking this, right? And you're right, there's so many, there's so much material coming out recently um, that attends to some of these sort of issues and thinking about, you know, Othello, thinking about Titus Andronicus. And I, you know, this is not my argument, but one of my colleagues is that every Shakespeare play is a race play because whiteness can be talked about in a racial way. Right. Um, so thinking about how do we work with whiteness in the plays as well. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I think like for me, what what prompted that question or comment was um, you said at one point the classroom is our battlefield. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's absolutely true. You know, thinking about um, all of these changes that need to be made. And you know, you were another thing that you said that was so poignant. Um, as you said, it was not built for me. And so many things in our society were not built for people of color. And yeah. so I think that that you're right that the classroom is the place where we have to tackle those first. You know, that's our first point of access for many students. Um, and that if we do the disservice of not addressing those things, then we have failed, you know? And yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I appreciate those statements. So of thank course. you. And the only thing I would say to that, I always say this to my students, you know, what happens here and what learns here has to leave here. Like it has to leave the classroom. It can't just be a vacuum that as a one-off you took your upper division like Shakespeare seminar, right? Like, no, think about what you're learning here and how is that applicable to your everyday life? right you know i'm a professor in the humanities so it's very much so you know something that i think about not just when i'm sitting down to do my work right so it's like what, what happens here and what you learn here has to leave here i'm like talk to your family about it you know whatever talk to your friends your peers but yeah great you're doing a good job amanda Love i know <laughs> Thanks. i see cheryl has had her hand up Hi, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your talk. And as someone who teaches English um, to freshmen and, and grad students, um, I uh, also try to find a way into the plays for my students. And one of the things that um, I found useful is talking about authorship yeah. and particularly with uh, Shakespeare, you know, being global and his understanding of the world and integrating all of that material, you know, I found that really effective. The other piece that you mentioned was Shakespeare and sexuality. And I feel like there's a lot we can do there to engage students because again, his understanding of psychology is quite mm -hmm. complex and the plays address a variety of uh, sexual um, and gender issues. So that's yeah, my, that's been my experience. Yeah, and it's and it's it's interesting. I just saw a production, a uh, one man show. It was called Shakespeare's Villains, and it was just monologues from all of the villains. And they would pause to talk about like psychology and, um, you know, the creation of this character, this archetype, right? That really kind of Shakespeare didn't create, but pioneered in so many ways, right? So I totally agree with you, Cheryl. And to that, I would add, I think one thing for me that's huge in my classroom is also thinking about class, right? Like class mm -hmm. within the play. Um, and even, you know, in relation to some of Shakespeare and his contemporaries, right? Like how do they engage with these kind of subjects in similar or different ways? Right, yeah, I think that's a really rich area comparing Shakespeare with other Elizabethan playwrights, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But thank you again. Of course, Donna. Maybe she doesn't have her hand up. <laughs> Other questions? Don't you think uh, of putting people in these roles uh, that are minorities, it's very important. Uh, it's interesting. I've seen a number of Shakespearean productions at the Old Globe and, you know, they do put a few in. Well, wouldn't it be something, you know, for the whole cast to be uh, Latinx or African-American? You know, it can be done. I mean... <laughs> It can be done. It makes no difference. And, uh, you know, things like that are, are so important. Um, uh, and if you, and, and then, you, you know, there's the thought, if you could do that in Shakespeare, you can do that in any play. And if you can't, what is the problem? 
Exactly. And, you know, it's often the excuse, like, well, we don't have the actors. And I'm like, I'm sure you can find some black or brown or Asian, whatever it is that you need to do this, to do this play effectively, right? And I feel like we're seeing it done so magnificently on television recently. I mean, I'm sure you're all watching Bridgerton, hopefully, um, or other <laughs> or other kind of um, TV, right? Which I think is so interesting. I'm also watching Dickinson, um, which is on Apple TV, which is amazing, 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 if you haven't seen it yet. Um, but this kind of fusion, not only of kind of a multi-ethnic cast, but of, I don't, what, I don't even know what the term would be like the like the mishmash of sort of contemporary culture but with like the world of Bridgerton or the world of Emily Dickinson right like it's it's being done and I'm hoping that our stages are are catching up to that um you know I've done a lot of work with San Diego Repertory Theater um because one of my colleagues and dear friends is our assistant artistic director there and like they're doing awesome work right to sort of to do exactly what Donna's saying is to cast shows that are really you know, effective and intelligent. So it's definitely done. And I will say this, this is, you know, not an incendiary thing to say, but I think it's easier to do it when you're a smaller theater, right? When you're a larger regional theater, you have donors, you answer to many other people, right? That make these decisions. So someone like, um, I did my PhD at UC Irvine. So I lived in Orange County for many years, um, you know, South Coast Theater there, is amazing, but they have a specific kind of audience and a specific donor base that mm -hmm. necessitates a certain kind of production, which is unfortunate. They yeah. don't do bad shows there, but it's a lot of the same kind of show, right? Yeah. Uh, I wrote a play and performed it. Yeah, it was performed at the 10th Avenue Theater and oh yeah, it was multicultural. It had all cultures in it. Yeah. I had no trouble finding actors of different uh, cultural backgrounds, shall we say. Yeah, uh, you know, and so uh, that that is too bad that that the uh, base, you know, of their their financial base would be affected, you know. Yeah, and it happens, right? It's I think theater can often be such a a contentious issue, right? I mean, look at the the list of banned plays that exist, right? That have been you know censored for whatever reason. It. It's interesting um, to think about, but I think it's also very much so like a money thing. And I live in Los Angeles, so we have the Mark Taper Forum and Center Theater Group, and they're very different, but they also have a lot more money than mm. the South Coast does. So it's kind of a, um, it's it, not a mess, but like it's such an interesting kind of dynamic, right? In San Diego, I will say this, I think San Diego has a much livelier theater culture and life than like Los Angeles does because you have the old globe, um, you have stuff going on at UCSD. Um, LA is a film town, mm. right? We make movies, we make TV. Um, theater gets done, but not as often. Other questions? Brian. Yeah, so um, sorry, I'm still sort of formulating the question a little bit because there's, there's obviously a lot that is happening. I'm thinking about La Frontera. I'm thinking about <laughs> kind of working through all those things at the same time. And it's interesting to me that you you know, you know talk about the adaptation of Holtville and some of the ways that those things work. And, and it, it sort of just makes me curious recognizing a lot of, um, I don't know, let's say like the, the white hegemony that, <laughs> that is Shakespeare, right? And, you know, as it's sort of been mentioned, you can't just put on different clothes and put it in a different setting and say it's something different, right? You're still using the language. You're still recognizing the culture that it's coming from. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a high level question, right? It's a little bit meta, but like, what does it mean? What are you intending or what do you think? Um, definitely more of a personal perspective, but what does it mean to do Shakespeare like uh, what, you know what I mean what is what is what does that mean how is that done what aspects keep it Shakespeare and when does it lose it Shakespeare I mean from adaptation to changing the language to changing the setting at one point you know what I mean it's, it's yeah. one of those, uh, how many grains of sand kind of thing of course of course you know I think about this all the time and when I get really frustrated with my work I'm just like why like why am I sitting here like thinking about Shakespeare um and um, I think 
<laughs> sorry, I was just looking at Amanda's <laughs> message and I, I wanted to laugh. Um, hi, Brian. Um, it's, I don't know. I'm gonna answer this on a personal level, right? Cause I can't speak for all the Shakespeareans of the world. I have a really difficult relationship with Shakespeare. On the one end, I think for me doing Shakespeare in the way that I do, I know is very sort of liberatory. And I feel like kind of, um, I'm the first, the hill I will die on is that I'm always trying to burn everything down. I'm all about burning everything down and the way that we know it and understand it so we can rebuild it in a better way. So I have this really fraught relationship with what it means to do Shakespeare, because on the one hand, I feel like I'm so clever because I'm so decolonial in my approach and I'm so transcendent in my approach. But then at the same time, I recognize that my doing Shakespeare is still upholding him in this kind of pedestal, this position that he will never be, you know, taken down from or, you know, next year, all of a sudden, like somebody else is going to be the best playwright ever in the history of the world, right? It's always going to remain a Shakespeare. So it's it's a hard one to think because like, what does it mean to do Shakespeare? For me, it's like, on some days on my bad days, it just means getting my paycheck, right? But on my better days, I'm just thinking about, you know, it really makes a difference to hybridize what we know and think is Shakespeare, right? It really means something to my students that me as a brown Mexican person, I can teach Shakespeare with authority and with confidence and sh show to them that, hey, you can do this too, right? It's about accessibility for me at the end of the day. It's all about accessibility. Um, what do you stand to lose with Shakespeare? Hopefully everything, right? Which is always kind of my end goal is to dismantle um, to dismantle that kind of like air of superiority or that like colonial kind of superpower that he retains. Of course, I'll never do away with it, but just thinking about the ways in which, you know, we can use Shakespeare as a tool, as a tool to speak back to empire, which is really what my academic work and my research entails is like, how do I, it's like the Audre Lorde, right? Like you've taught me these tools, so you're the master. So now I'm going to use these tools to dismantle the house. And I know that that's not possible, but I'm gonna try, right? So that's sort of where where I am with that. I don't know, do you have an opinion on that? Oh, no, I was I was just, like I said, I was just sort of trying to get your um, your meaning out of it. And, and yes, immediately, just based off the talk and what you said, there was this feedback loop of destruction that I could see, but I just didn't know if that was the goal and it's nice to hear it, right? Like it's- yeah. It's, it's something also very refreshing to hear someone sort of admit that 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 is sort of like the the post-colonial project or I mean not the post-colonial but you know you know I mean like yeah. to get rid of it to to oust it is to have to undo everything you have to use it to undo itself it's sort of a the, the Marxist tools of oppression or yeah both. Absolutely. And you know, I'm always, I actually texted Amanda yesterday, because I was like, if I say like incendiary things about Shakespeare, will the San Diego Shakespeare Society hate me? <laughs> or will they be upset? Um, because I'm, sometimes when I talk about the work that I do, people get really upset, right? People are just like, how can you say that about Shakespeare? He's so wonderful. He's so great. And, I'm, and it's like, I'm not saying that he's not. I'm just saying, like, let's look at the fact that in Mexico, people know Shakespeare's work more than they do their own sort of local writers. That to me is an issue, right? Like Gordon was saying, why is Shakespeare so big in India? I mean, I know why, right? We all know why. But thinking about how sort of these legacies of colonialism, we are still dealing with, right? But we don't approach them in that way. So for me, it's always about um, tear not tearing down Shakespeare, but definitely challenging that colossus right, and thinking about the ways in which um, we can use them to speak back to empire. So thank you for that question, Brian, I appreciate it. Well, I think at this time, um, I wanna thank everybody who asked questions and those of you that attended the, the talk, um, but we're reaching about an hour and a half, so we wanna give you the freedom to leave the talk. Um, yes. And uh, thank you again to Dr. Garcia for um, presenting to us. Um, we do have some upcoming lectures. And again, please make sure that you're checking our website for some upcoming events. We are still very active, even though we are mostly virtual. Um, so on your way out, if you'll use the little hand emoji, give uh, Dr. Garcia your applause. Uh, leave thank any you. Comments. And thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I would love to come back whenever for anything that you all do. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you.
Thank you, Letty. It was wonderful. Just oh, wonderful. thank you. I'm glad you all enjoyed it.